Thanks for all sticking around to the uh, Friday afternoon slot. Um, I'm going to be talking on integrity protection and access control, um, and actually just a mix of the two. Uh, the talk itself is only designed to be about 20 minutes long, um, which leaves lots of room for discussion. Um, and I've actually got a couple of slides at the end of the talk that I'll be doing for discussion. Um, and so hopefully that will um, take up the rest of the time, or we'll leave a little bit early. Um, First, a caveat, the opinions in here are my own, um, and so that makes discussion just a little bit easier. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire company. So let's take a look. What can an attacker do if they actually get physical access to your system? Um, well, if your file system isn't encrypted, they can do a whole lot. They can basically do whatever they want, right? They can read and modify the POSIX permissions, read and modify any of the SE Linux labels on the file system. Um, file contents, directory structure, right? This, they can do a lot, right? But the question is, of course, who cares? Yeah, this isn't new. We all know this, right? This is why we encrypt our file systems, right? This is why we use things like DM Verity. Well, who actually does care? Um, Android actually does care. Um, and the reason Android cares is because they've got a one partition, which is nice and trusted, and it's got all your file system data on it, right? Your system partition. They got another file system where that's supposed to have all of the untrusted data. You know, things like someone's photos, right? Things like all of the apps that you've downloaded, those sorts of things, right? Your system partition, that's where you put all the trusted stuff. The user data, that's where you put all the untrusted stuff, right? DMCrypt to the rescue, right? Now, DMCrypt is great, right? And it encrypts all of this. Now, there's a couple of caveats, right? Encryption does not imply integrity protection. Right? So just because you've encrypted something doesn't mean someone can't modify it. Right? And so you have to choose the proper algorithms. Um, and it also doesn't protect against root persistence. So let's say someone does manage to get elevated privileges on your system. Okay? Once they've got those elevated privileges, they can go and they can modify those file systems. Right? And DMCrypt is going to give them the unencrypted view so that they can do that. So what happens if we don't use DMCrypt? At least in the Android place, space, um, let's take a look at some of those SE Linux or permissions. So Android actually has the ability to store your SE Linux policies on the user data partition as well as storing them on the system partition. Right? Um, and they're stored in a, data call, in a directory called slash data slash security. Um, and that directory is labeled with the security file. And if you actually take a look, security file is pretty locked down. There's only a couple of domains on the system that are allowed to access that directory. Untrusted app is not one of them. However, untrusted app can read and write to media data, media data files. This is, well, pretty obviously something that, a me, that an app might want to do. But what happens if we do have a physical attacker and we don't have DM Verity? Well, let's just update the label. Let's call that entire security directory a, I don't know, a media read write data file, right? And we've all of a sudden given read write access to all the apps on the system, right? Any app on the system could then, you know, say, ah, oh, actually, let's use this SE Linux policy. And that's not really what we're looking to do here. Right. And in fact, um, there is code in Android to to, allow, to read from these directories, right? And use those as their SE policies. All right, so what we actually did uh, at BlackBerry is we actually developed something and we call it Path Trust. Uh, and the whole idea behind Path Trust is prevent applications installed on the user data from running with super user permissions, right? Now it's a fairly rudimentary um, Linux security module. Um, and I'll also caveat this by saying Path Trust was not the best name we could have chosen. All right, um, Path Trust is a carryover from QNIX. Um, I don't know how much people know about QNIX. I know I'm widening into dangerous territory here with another uh, kernel. Um, but QNIX does everything based on paths, um, and they've got a path manager. Um, this was originally done on QNIX, which is why it's called Path Trust, because it relied on the path manager. All right, so what is super user for Path Trust? Well, super user is someone running with some specific um, capabilities. Um, so DAC override, MAC admin, sysadmin, module, these sorts of Linux capabilities. Um, and it's 
or it's someone trying to run with specific SE Android types. Things like init probably shouldn't come off of user data. They should be on the system partition. And so if we have an app trying to run under the init context that is also coming from the user data partition, there's something really weird going on. Right? And there's a bunch of other ones as well. What is run? All right. Run is executing something through execv, uh, M mapping with execute permissions um, for, a, for a, fi a, a file backed portion of memory. Loading kernel module, right? Kernel modules have been discussed before. Um, there was another LSM, uh, which was uh, load pin, um, and that actually pins them to the particular partition um, where the first kernel or module was loaded from, right? Loading as firmware and actually executing as a script as well, right? And so here's a very, very brief example here, right? You copy the shell off the system partition onto the user data partition, and then you try and run it, and it says, sorry, you're not permitted to do that, right? Um, and you'll notice here I was trying to run it as root. Now, if you're not trying to run as a super user, I don't care where you run it from, right? You can run non-root programs from the user data partition. In fact, if you couldn't, your Android system wouldn't work so well. And the other example, of course, is shells. So you can create a simple shell script here, throw it on your user data partition, run and run it, and the shell's gonna come back and say, ah, sorry, I'm not gonna let you do that. Um, and we do that just by talking to the Linux security module through a de device node, so. Okay, how does it work? So there's about six steps involved, and the first step is we wanna know which file systems are trustable. Right? And so by trustable, I mean they're a file system that was either integrity checked by the previous boot order or previous component in the boot chain, um, or it's a file system with DM Verity on it. And so those are the file systems that we consider trustable. Right? And trustable is different than trusted. Right? So the first thing we do is we look at DM Verity, we say, okay, this is a file coming in, or a file system, or sorry, DM Verity. This is a block device which is trustable. Got to get my terminology right. Okay. And then when we go to mount assist file system, we actually added another mount option, um, and it is trusted. Right. And so when you actually try and mount something as trusted, it'll go through and it'll try and figure out whether or not this is a trustable block device. Uh, and we did this because it's really hard to poke down through all of the VFS layers to figure out the underlying block device and whether or not that underlying block device is DM Verity when you're looking at things from the very high level. So we go through and now we have something mounted as trusted because we've passed the trusted flag to mount and it is trustable. And then we just intercept the uh, Linux security module calls um, to the various functions that we need to um, implement, right? And so if we're trying to run with super user permissions, verify that the underlying file system is trusted. And then export a device node so that other people can query and say, hey, I'm gonna try and run this file. Um, is this file something that I should be running? Uh, and based on the permissions of whoever is going to try and run that file, sorry, based on whether or not who is going to run that file is a super user or has running with elevated privileges, we say yes or no, right? And that's how we do things like the shell. All right, that is it in a nutshell. Um, but let's, let's step back from that and let's take a look at the pitfalls of it. Right? Because version one is never the most amazing thing in the world, I'm all done, let's go home, pack up. It doesn't stop a privileged application from accessing untrusted files. Right? The only thing it does is stop them from running. Right? And so if we wanted to expand this and we wanted to go more general, what could we do? Well, we, we could try and address these sorts of problems. Right? What is the intersection between integrity protection DM Verity or whatever else you're using, right? In theory, we could use a file-based integrity protection where you could have certain files on a file system that are integrity protected, right? And therefore, maybe we want to give them different permissions. Um, all PathTrust does is stop a privileged application from invoking, in this case, we're gonna call it attacker-provided code, right? <coughs> well, wait a second. 
Isn't access control what SE Linux is already for, right? If we're gonna try and stop someone from doing something, that sounds like access control, right? Um, and yes, it is, but SE Linux doesn't know anything about the underlying file system that the labels are on, right? It assumes that the labels are good. All right, uh-oh, profile encryption. Let's throw out DM Verity now, right? Uh, and let's go to profile encryption. Uh, now, it is coming. Um, it has dropped in ext4. Um, I don't know whether it's on mainline yet. Um, but are the extended attribute records for ext4 integrity protected? Are they encrypted? Uh, well, not currently. Okay. The only thing that is actually protected by ext4 encryption um, or profile encryption is the name of the file and the contents of the file. Right? And so you can have a file that you can't actually read the contents of if you're an offline attacker. But you can change the permissions on it and then just reboot the system. Right? Uh, and if you change the permissions on it and reboot the system and you also have code running on that system, then you can then start to read the file right? because the kernel will helpfully um, uh, decrypt it for you. Now, um, extended attribute records, they are a possible future thing. Um, just like I said, Path Trust was version one, right? Uh, ext4 per file encryption support is not finished, I'm sure, right? There's probably more patches coming for it. All right, so that's, that's the general overview of the talk. Um, and now I wanna actually get into some of the discussion debate, and I'm hoping that um, people in the room will be able to partake in this one, right? Um, and so I've got four questions here, and I've got a slide on each, um, but I'm not gonna put the slide up on each and, uh, unless we want the slide on each of them. Um, so the first question, of course, is should we include the notion of integrity protection into a access control system such as SE Linux? Now I use SE Linux in this example um, because Android is tied to SE Linux, right? But it's equally applicable to SMAC. It's equally applicable to um, AppArmor or any of the other access control systems, right? Is it something that we even want to do? Right? And I'm not, uh, just because the question is up here, I'm not saying that you know, we should all go out and do it, right? or even that I should go out and write the code. Um, it's more of a question of should we? Right? Um, should integrity protection require encryption? Is there any use in actually doing integrity protection for a file without doing encryption? Um, now, from a purely theoretical standpoint, yes, right? The two shouldn't be tied to each other. However, from a deployability and people outside of this room who are not as versed in security, are we likely to provide a set of tools to them such that they will do one without the other and screw it up, right? Do we want them to integrity protect a file that really should have been encrypted, right? Do we want them to encrypt the file and not put integrity protection on it, right? How much flexibility do we actually want to give to people? What's the relative priority of protecting metadata, right? I've mentioned that the ext4, or sorry, the extended attributes are not integrity protected. Is it really the top of the list though, right? Or are there bigger fish that we need to fry first? Um, and finally, can we do it generically with loopback and dmcrypt, right? I've pointed out that, you know, there's a lot of things other than the name of the file and the contents of the file that, you know, we could use some protection for, right? What happens if we actually take and we create two massive files sparsely allocated, right, on a single file system? Each of these sparse files is the size of the file system, right? And then we create new file systems in these sparse files. Well, in theory, right, we could actually have multiple different encryption domains, right, with multiple different keys, multiple different DM crypts. All of the metadata would be encrypted. However, there's caveats, right? Um, free space isn't reported correctly, but that's just the beginning of the problem because what happens if you run out of hard drive space on something that is a DMCrypt looped back file? I have no idea. Um, I'm gonna guess not good things. That's all I've got. Um, and so those are the four questions. Um, does anybody have any comments? Yeah. <laughs> How could I have guessed? You're throwing out, out the challenge here. Um, one of the biggest problems 
with encrypting metadata is that it is predictable. Yep. Uh, so, for example, there isn't much point in, uh, if you encrypted the mode bits, that would give you a really good, good handle on the encryption technology and the encryption key. Give you yeah, so there's ways of doing yeah. encryption well, where you're not yeah. going to necessarily know. Yeah, okay. But, but then you're getting expensive. So you're going to be, in order to do cryptography on small pieces of data, uh, you're going to be massively extending the expense of doing it. The, yeah, if you have to have a key for every, for example, for every inode, um, now you're going to have lots and lots of keys. You're going yep. to, uh, but if you don't do that, then you're going to get hit, ran, ran smack into predictability. Uh, is, uh, EX24 encryption actually does derive a unique key for every file. And it does so quickly. Good for you. <laughs> okay, well, why aren't you encrypting the, the metadata then? Because he had to start somewhere, and starting with everything is hard. <laughs> So I, um, I do have a, a patch that allows um, the file system to specify which keys are being encrypted by which blocks in deencrypt. Um, and so it's possible to, for example, have a deencrypt-wide common key for uh, the entire device, while at the same time having the option of being able to choose a different key for individual file contents, depending upon which user is logged in and is using the device. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, I don't know if everybody understands sort of why DMCrypt is being phased out in favor of VXT4. Um, DMCrypt, if you reboot your device, bad things. I don't get my alarm in the morning, right? Um, I can't encrypt, uh, for example, now with uh, Android for Work where you've got work and personal data on the same device. I can't, I can't encrypt them with different keys um, if I've just got one DMCrypt. Right. This is just a slide of what I sort of explained verbally either earlier about, you know, okay, how do you do DMCrypt um, if you want to actually have multiple different encryption keys? Um, it's messy. <laughs> There's a whole lot of gotchas in this one, which are not fully flushed out. Yeah, and I, and I suppose I should also mention that part of the original design was to do encryption with integrity, um, so GCM mode. Um, and uh, I do actually have a... Um, a prototype patch for encryption with integrity sitting around and, and we're just working on making it stable. Mm. Um, there are a number of different uh, uh, games you can play at this point where you say, suppose I want metadata protection with integrity. Um, this is where we're going to have to start talking about where we get the space for the additional cryptographic metadata in the block yeah. device. Um, do, you, do you say, okay, we're going to take a certain amount of available space in the block device and re reserve a certain part of that and say, okay, this is where we keep that metadata. Um, or do we want to start playing games instead of, of, of making uh, manipulations at the device mapper layer? Uh, would we want to do a loopback mount uh, on an ext4 file that's integrity protected? Right? So loopback mounts all the way down um, the stack. There are also concerns from an implementation standpoint as far as maintaining the consistency between the cryptographic metadata, the authentication tags, and so forth with the ciphertext. Um, those have to be consistent with each other. And that, become, that presents a challenge because um, with DMCrypt and unauthenticated modes of encryption, when you write a single block of plain text, you end up, get, you end up getting a single block of ciphertext. Yep. That's nice and easy. Um, but if instead, when you write a single block of ciphertext, you additionally have to store um, an authentication tag, for instance, associated with that, well, suddenly now you have an opportunity for a system crash or power failure uh, to result in inconsistency and hence result in data loss. Um, and, and then you need something like copy on write semantics or log yeah. structured volume, and, and the complexity increases at that point. There's a lot of discussion to be had on this. Um, I don't know if I should have a birds of the feather session where those who may be interested want to talk more about it. Um, but I, I've been thinking very carefully about these issues and writing a lot of prototype code. Yeah, yeah. And that, oh. Dave Sapper. <laughs> so. A couple comment on, on your questions. Um, historically, should we include the notion of integrity in Desi Linux? Um, back when IMO was first going in the kernel, um, 
we actually sat down with Smalley and et al. And mm -hmm. the decision was back then, uh, one option was to stack, one option was you know for IMA to be in a, 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 a to be an LSM module. Yeah. And the decision back then was to say no, we want this separate because any LSM may want to ask the integrity subsystem information about the files, and uh, regardless of which LSM it was. Yeah. So it was you know deliberately made a separate thing uh, where the mandatory access control could ask you know yeah. and base but, its decisions on it. Yeah. And I guess the result of that is that as far as I know none of the access control systems take the integrity information into account in terms of your being able to write policy. The, and integrity protection on the labels, in particular, um, the, the SE Linux labels, which are extended attributes. Yeah. You know, if, if they want protection from offline attack, they can use EBM and things. Um, the second thing, should integrity protection require encryption? Um, you're not. You're, you're, you're posing this as as uh, um, two things, and you're missing kind of the third one, which is authenticity. So I would argue that. Integrity slash authenticity. Uh, first of all, you have to have to have the concept of authenticity, or we can't actually, you know, prove for those use cases that want attestation. You you can't just do it with you know a symmetric key. You have to have a yep. you know public key. Um, and, and so we need to extend the concept of integrity protection from being just you know uh, DM Verity to being other types of things like IMA. Um, and, and that can be very important for people, far more important than encryption. So I would say the argument should be not should integrity protection require encryption, but all things should require uh, integrity and, and or authenticity protection. And maybe we might want to do encryption on top of that. Um, yeah, so being able to do encryption without integrity, right? are we allowing people to shoot themselves in the foot? No, what we're saying is no, you shouldn't. You should have policy that says, you know, uh, but but it's a flip side of what you're asking in the que in the question. Yeah. It's not should integrity require encryption. It's should encryption require integrity. And the obvious answer is yes, it should, but not the other way around. Integrity should not require encryption. Encryption should require integrity. Uh, for the top question, um, mostly just a comment, which is uh, I, I think we go about it the opposite way, which is that we write SE Linux policy uh, with integrity in mind. And so uh, a, an example would be um, for kernel module loading, we restrict kernel module loading. Uh, we restrict that modules only come from a DM Verity protect protected partition, for example, or yep. we only allow system server to execute code off the system parti partition, which is uh, DM Verity protected. Um, so, Yeah, so uh, that's, that's what I did in PathTrust. Um, but without sort of a system like that, how do you know that that is actually happening? What do you mean? So if you are just loading a kernel module, right? You have to figure out where the kernel module came from, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and that is, well, there's a couple of ways of different loading kernel modules depending on which syscall you use, right? Um, you can either pass a file handle into the kernel um, or you can actually pass just a blob of data into the kernel. Yeah, so we're only allowing uh, FNIT. So we're only allowing, currently we're only allowing uh, yeah. file module loading through um, the file descriptor. Yeah, and so if you have the file descriptor, you can, you can go back and you can get the SE Linux context for it. But how do you know whether or not to trust the context, right? Whether or not you can trust the context associated with that file depends on the file system that it's on and whether or not that file system is actually integrity protected or whether it's something that the attacker could just take, you know, take the flash chip and go, ah, I'm going to set the, you know, extended attributes to whatever I want to and now you will load my kernel module. Right? So with path-based access control, yep. doesn't it not matter there? Because you're not trust if the if the access control policies come from your trusted partition. Yeah, so if 
your untrusted files, or if your untrusted partition is always mapped to the same location, and you know that it's always going to be mapped to the same location, then yes, you can actually do a. Can you Yeah. So if we wanted to relabel on every boot or on every mount, then we could do that. I'm not convinced that the overhead in in relabeling on every mount is small. Well, for some of the partitions, they're read-only, so we don't have to uh, relabel them. Um, for example, the system partition has the labeling uh, in the system partition itself. Um, but the labeling in the system partition itself, the system partition is also integrity protected, which means that we know we don't have to relabel it. With SO Linux, you can say we you can mount a file system and well mount a specific point and set to context for everything under this uh, this moon point. So I don't know exactly how in Android it's made currently when you mount user data, uh, but you could say like uh, everything that comes from uh, that something that's not DM Verity protected is mounted with a specific SO Linux context and. Every context that is set in the files under this won't ever matter. You could. Um, here, I'll get away from the speaker. Um, and and that would enforce that everything on a specific file system had to have a specific label. At which point you're saying there's only one label for that file system. Um, I don't know if that's flexible enough, um, right? You know, I, I thought about it a bit, and I was like, okay, well, if we were to include integrity protection into the notion of an actual SE Linux policy, how would we do it, right? Do we create a new type of class or a new class, right? Maybe we have file and then we have trusted file. Eh, I'm not sold on it, right? Do we create new permissions on already existing type classes? You know, do we have, you know, uh, read trusted, which is different than read? Eh, I'm not sold on that one either. Right? You know, do we restrict certain labels? Right? And so you say, okay, if you came from an integrity protected file system, you can have all the labels. If you come from a not integrity protected file system, you can only have these subset of labels. Right? And that's more similar to what you're talking about there. Yes, it does. Um, and, and so then the question, of course, is what happens when we take that away? Right, right. And, you know, I, I sense that, that we probably don't want to try to expand SE Linux's adversarial model after the fact. It's been very carefully designed in that model um, and, and treat the platform integrity as a separate problem and, and, and address that in a separate layer. But we're not going to talk about IMA this time. We're going to talk about EVM. Have, um, I couldn't hear David before. I, I didn't hear David before if he mentioned EVM. I heard about him talking about the decision that integrity was separated intentionally from SC Linux um, and that it was a separate subsystem. But the question, and that's part of the EVM, and it's, it is an LSM for all practical purposes. Um, but there was never, an, there was, and they wanted um, EVM to verify the metadata. It protects the metadata for offline attack. But there's, there is a call from IMA into EVM. And that same call could be used from SE Linux or from any other LSM. It doesn't have to be called directly from IMA if the LSM wants to incorporate that. And so that goes back to, do we actually want to modify SE Linux? Or, you know, as you mentioned, SE Linux has been very carefully architected for a certain threat model. Let's leave it and put all the integrity somewhere else. Yes, there's something else about uh, the context when you mount 
uh, a specific file system somewhere. Uh, I'm not 100% sure because I'm the S Linux maintainer is not here. But like um, when we do CSFS, uh, we they are separated uh, S Linux context for files in CSFS. Of course, CSFS is a virtual file system, so you don't really have extended attributes. Um, but the, you can write a policy, and uh, specific files in CSFS would get specific labels. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could do the same thing for um, specific moment points that would have interested data uh, on it. Yeah, and so that actually um, relies on relabeling CSFS every time we mount it, as far as I know. I don't know. Any other discussion? So we talked about encryption and integrity. Have we considered authenticating encryption with associated data, so put the metadata as the associated data? Right, and so the question was, um, you know, authenticated encryption modes such as GCM have has the AAD parameter, which is the um, additional authenticated data. Um, and so your question is, you know, could you just put in the extended attributes as um, what, what's what's um, included in, in what's covered there? That way, you could wind up um, protecting the uh, the metadata with the key for that individual file, as opposed to a key for the entire block device. Um, so, yes, that, that is a possibility. You could do that. Um, although you do have a, a bit of a chicken and an egg issue because um, there is cryptographic context for the file that is stored in the extended attributes with per file encryption because it needs to know which key is being used to protect the file in the first place. Um, anyway, <laughs> if you pick the wrong key, then you're not going to be able to um, authenticate anyway, right, and check the integrity. Um, so I, I'll have to chew on that for a bit and, 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 and think about whether there's any um, particular flaw or, or vulnerability that could extend from that. Um, but in general, we, we do want to have general protection beyond just the extended attributes of the files. We want to protect um, you know, the ownership of the files, the sizes of the, of the files, the contents of the directories, um, how many files are in the directories, what the directory um, hierarchy or structure is. All of this leaks information that might be useful to an attacker who might want to know, are you running Tor? Um, or something of that sort. Yeah, and depending on your threat model, another attack too is you completely delete the directory, recreate it under a different encryption domain, and then just wait for them to repopulate the files. Yes, and, and in fact, uh, we address that in Android through relabeling in essence. And yeah. so there is a, um, a hierarchical mechanism in ext4 where every time a child of a particular directory, either a file or another subdirectory, um, gets accessed, it validates that the that the encryption policy for that file or directory matches that of its parent. Then when Android boots, it sets the root policy of mm. the directories um, based on contents that are rooted in the DM Verity protected system partition. And so we end up having a root of trust that links yep. down there and is validated at runtime. Um, but you have to be careful in whatever context you're deploying to make sure you're actually doing that in order to make sure you have that level of, of integrity. And so for something that's more general purpose than just a, um, you know, a, a file system on a mobile device, uh, well, you know, it's something that we have to think about. So this, you mentioned about the ASGCM. So basically the extra authentication token will bring some overhead plus it's based on AES counter mode, and you need to make sure that you never use the same nonce value again, so it's going to be open to some such attacks, basically. Yes. And so you've rightly pointed out that um, Galois counter mode um, is an extraordinarily brittle encryption uh, <laughs> um, uh, mechanism. And um, I look for it. Is anyone familiar with the Caesar competition? No? Okay, look it up, it's great. Uh, Caesar competition, there's, there's actually um, a, an effort underway to replace uh, GCM. 
And so there are a lot of um, really promising candidates that have been proposed that don't have this vulnerability where, uh, you know, because the ghash is a linear function. Um, and so the problem is if you wind up using the same initialization vector for any two blocks that are encrypted with the same key, uh, then, then the auth key pretty much falls out. Um, you lose it. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, you have to be very careful with what you, want, what you wind up architecting, how you use it. Um, I, I've always used to say crypto is easy and um, key management is hard. Uh, I've since changed the tune of <laughs> uh, how I say it. I now say crypto is hard, key management is hard. Um, so with ASGCM, um, what we've done with, with the architecture for, for ext4 is um, we're actually uh, randomly generating a new key for every single block. So we are doing um, you know, rapid key derivation. Um, in order to help minimize the probability of a collision for any given key and initialization vector. Where are, you and where are we getting the entropy from? Uh, so we're using the kernel entropy pool, um, which we trust pretty much for everything else, <laughs> be it you know, IPsec keys or what have you. If you happen to be on an Intel platform, uh, you, know, you have the read rand instruction, which winds up putting entropy into that pool um, and, and so forth. Uh, but yeah, that, that is a concern that if, if you were to boot an embedded device and if you, you know, this, uh, the embedded device were to not get any information about disk seek timing or network packet timing or something, um, then yeah, there's a concern that you could wind up hitting, you know, running against an entropy wall there. So if you've got multiple VMs, which are also using it. Right, and so if you're using um, a, a VM, you would hope that, you, that your um, virtualization layer is passing through the read rand instruction to the guest. Um, or you're doing some mechanism for passing through entropy from the host into the guest. Yeah, I, I know, but you might, you, might, you might start exhausting it if you've got multiple VMs all using this and doing lots of other virtual operations. Uh, if you have the read-rand instruction, I don't think exhaustion is a concern. Um, that the read-rand can actually go as quickly as you need it to from an entropy perspective. Um, but yeah. No, the IP settings do not come from the kernel random pool. Oh, they don't? Oh, it doesn't. Okay, so um, it's being pointed out to me that, that I've, I've flubbed. Uh, so IPsec, <laughs> IPsec entropy actually comes from other sources in the kernel entropy pool. You don't read from dev u random or dev random. Um, you, you, you actually get your seed from elsewhere. It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I might, I might suggest adding what you get from dev u random into whatever it is you're doing. It, it can only help. Okay, so there, so there's entropy that's mixed from the two sides of the um, through through the Diffie-Hellman exchange, uh, key exchange mechanism. Okay, so this is this is an area I do storage encryption. I don't do this whole wire encryption stuff. So I'm going to defer to the <laughs> to the protocols folks for for expertise and what's happening there. So we got about five minutes left. If there's no further discussion. All right, I'll wrap it up. Thanks.